it really is a delight to be here. Um, when Cinder first wrote me and asked me to be a uh, co-facilitator, my heart was filled with joy. I just thought, oh, this is just wonderful that they would ask me to come and, 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 and share and be a part of that. Then when she wrote me again and asked me to speak, my joy turned to fear and trembling. <laughs> I feel like I'm a little bit different than the other speakers and that I, I, I still feel more like an apprentice. I know that we're all studying, we're all learning, we're all growing, but I still feel very much like an apprentice and would much rather be sitting there uh, listening to, to others than, than to speak. I've heard, we've heard some testimonies of, of people who have grown up in the community, have come to Christ as a result of our ministries, and then after a, a short period of time away, uh, studies or whatever, they come back and they, they become leaders in their community. That is not my testimony. I came to back to the inner city kicking and screaming all the way. I grew up in a small town on Long Island, New York, <laughs> called Bellboy. All right, all right. And I grew up in, in my small town, we were uh, literally divided by railroad tracks. Blacks on one side, whites on the other. One side very, very poor, the other side very, very rich. The only place we met was in the uh, school system. I can remember in the seventh grade uh, walking down the hall and being confronted by a gang, a uh, group of, of guys from my neighborhood that were dead formed a gang. And they cornered me and they said, uh, Ted, you're going to join our gang. And I looked at them and said, No, I'm going to stay in the music department. And that's where I went. <laughs> I hung out in the music part. Music was my thing. When I was in, in third grade, my parents got me into the choir, and they put a trombone in my hands, and they said, this is what we want you to do. Right. And I decided that that is the way I was going to spend my time. Well, I, was, I did not want to hang out with, with, with the gang. That put me into a position where I was the only black person in the music department. Well, years later, I can remember in the 11th grade when, by that time, I had received uh, a great deal of recognition for my musical abilities. I would eat, sleep, and, and drink music. And consequently, I, I, I had a leadership role in the music department and consequently in the school, because in our school we didn't have a strong sports department. Music was the thing. Um, but I can remember in the 11th grade walking down the hall and being confronted by a couple of guys, and I remember them being uh, a couple of the guys that were in that gang. Only this time, they didn't ask me if I wanted to be a part of the gang. They asked me if I wanted to, if I could help them uh, learn how to sing, or if I could teach them how to play an instrument. And I, and I felt really bad about that. I felt that they had wasted all this time. But music was my ticket out of the community. Because of my musical ability, I was able to go to college and study, and my goal was to be a, uh, a music educator. I wanted to be the head of the music department. And in my fourth year of college, uh, there had a program at my school where for where one year you could study at uh, any university, in a university overseas. And so I applied and was accepted at the Vienna Conservatory for Music, and, and uh, I went over there to study. A little realizing that uh, that's where God would change my life. I met a friend who told me about this international chapel. I walked into that international chapel and uh, heard the gospel. I heard it and saw it. It was interesting. I walked into that that room, and they really didn't have a they didn't have like a, a steeple or a big 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 church. They met in the foyer of a, of a small opera house. And uh, I can remember walking up the stairs, going up to going up to this this meeting place, and seeing all these people. Vienna is an international community. This was an English-speaking chapel, and I can remember just seeing a variety of people, hearing people speaking different languages. But the, the service was in English, so if you could speak English, then you could you could understand the uh, the, the, uh, the message. If you understood English, you could understand the message. 
uh, but just seeing these people relate to each other, and I could see, it was, I could tell that these people really loved each other. I'd never been in such a, 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 a mixed con a congregation. But then I went down to the Sunday school, and a Sunday school teacher preached the gospel, and I was just blown away by it. Uh, spent the next two weeks just reading, reading the Bible that someone had given me, and the more I read, I couldn't see those, didn't find those discrepancies or inconsistencies. All I read about was this person named Jesus, who died for my sins. And the more I read about him, the more I wanted to know him. And so two weeks later, I went back to that church and I gave my life to Christ. Well, I ended up spending two years in that in that chapel. It was an exciting place. There were uh, mission, a lot of missionaries were there. They did a lot of traveling behind the Iron Curtain, and they would take me with them. I can remember going into uh, traveling with them to a to a, a church in in Hungary. I can remember walking in with this other guy, and we walked in, and the pastor looked at us and he asked two questions: Which one of you preaches, and which one of you sings? Okay, so I didn't sing. They didn't ask me to preach, uh, but. Um, and that, that's when I started. That's when I started singing. I started singing a cappella songs. Uh, but it was a marvelous experience. And I wanted to be a missionary. I I told God, I said, God, I'll go anywhere in the world you want me to go, except back to the community, uh, the type of community that I came from. I did not want to go back there. And I can remember God taking me through a uh, a real experience. Um, I was over my pastor's house, and he had been nudging me. He said, you know, Ted, you really ought to go back. You really ought to consider serving uh, in the inner city. Uh, he said, you really ought to consider that. I said, no, 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 that's not where God's going. That's not where God's going. And uh, as I was leaving his house that one morning, he asked me a question. He says, Ted, I wonder if you realize that you're black. <laughs> And that's when I realized that the profound truth that God had created me in His image and He made me black. And I had to deal with that. And I had to come to embrace that and enjoy that. So that's when I prayed and cut this prayer of prayer where God, if you want me to go back to the inner city, that's where I'll go. So at that point, things shifted. I, I applied. I had graduated from college. I applied and was accepted at Denver Seminary. Went to Denver and uh, started uh, started uh, studies at seminary. But I also wanted to find out a little bit about their inner city. And it was interesting. I remember the, uh, being, at, being at the seminary, uh, talking to some students, and listening to them talk about this place for five points. They talked about how it's a terrible, terrible place. And, and I asked them, after a while they were talking, I said, well, uh, have you ever been there? And they said, oh, no, we've never been there. For, for a ministry 
and it's built up from within the community. And so I turned to YFC and said, I gotta go. And so I left and started developing uh, neighborhood ministries in 1980. But there just continued to get, just continued that, that frustration and really struggled. And one of the things I struggled with was that I did not have a mentor. I didn't have anyone that I knew of at the time that I could point to who looked like me, who was doing the same sort of thing, who had some answers who could help me. And then uh, it was in 1982 that I was introduced to Brother John. And uh, that year he came out to Denver twice uh, for a couple of conferences and I attended uh, both of them. And I walked away with just some, some new vision, some, some new hope, and some new excitement. And uh, ever since that time, I've sensed, I don't know what John's agenda has been with me, but I know that he's invited me on a number of these different small, these, these small group deals, and I've gone to a number of them, and each time I've been able to, to, to say, he makes me sing. I, I can't, I haven't been able to sing, so. But, but every time I go, he makes, he makes me sing. And um, I also get to sit and listen and, and learn from the various people. And uh, God is, as a result, of that encouragement and help. God has richly blessed us. Uh, we have a number of clubs in our community with, uh, with uh, young people, and, and we're, we're doing a lot in, in terms of, of, of motivation and, and development and, and challenging their worldview and helping them gain a, a God-centered worldview. And we're, we're challenging as far as their, their view of themselves. Uh, our focus has been community development, through people development. We've got some literacy programs going, and we've just seen some exciting things where kids are, 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 are learning that, 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 that learning is fun, and, uh, and it's, it's exciting to see. Uh, out, of a, out of a burden for some of the things we saw happening in some of our families, we created a counseling center, and we have some professional counseling that's going on for, for families in, in our community. We're burdened with a lot of the uh, uh, the families that were a single parent, uh, many of them in the projects or on the systems, that just needed, needed help, needed encouragement. We found that somehow there are all kinds of needs, but that central need was for a significant other to help people understand who Christ is and His love and help them have a proper view of themselves, that they have worth because God considers them, uh, gives them worth. And so therefore, we, we started working with some, some of the families, some of the moms with the smaller children, and started providing some, some help and assistance for them. And, and, uh, and, it, and it's, it's been really exciting. It's really been, it's really been growing. And God has, has greatly blessed us as a ministry. And Denver, Denver is a, a little bit different from Chicago. It's a younger city. It's a smaller city. And what we've found is that we have, God has raised up different ministries in our, in our community that are focused on specific things. You've got ministries here that are doing a variety of things, healthcare, jobs, uh, uh, housing, a number of different things. But we have, we have a number of specific ministries that are targeting one thing. We have a, a, a whole community that's involved with housing in our community. We have an inner city health center uh, uh, that's, that's concerned with health. But what we do is we network together. But our focus is, is starting with, with people and working with them, helping them to, to understand the gospel, and then networking with other organizations. So it's been real exciting. And it's been exciting to be here, and I've, I've been challenged in, in a couple of areas, and I want to share them with you. One is in the area of, of, of leadership. I find that... I, I find it a constant challenge to be growing as a community leader, but not only growing and going through the ups and downs and the, and the bumps and the scars, but also to be transparent with all of that so that others, others can see. I, one of the things I've really appreciated about John Perkins is that he's not been afraid to, to share his weaknesses or his failures. And I think I have learned as much from those as I have from from his successes, um, because it means that he's, he's real. It shows me what God is working in his life, and it helps me, but it's very hard to be transparent. You don't want to show, uh, don't want to show those things. 
And I find that this whole challenge of leadership, not so much leadership development uh, in, 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 in the people that we serve, but leadership development in ourselves. I find that probably one of my, my greatest struggles with some of my colleagues in Denver is that I'm not sure that we are really growing as leaders. That we are really developing. I'm not sure we're giving our, 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 uh, the, the people in our community uh, enough to, to look at in terms of how are we growing, how are we developing. I, I heard, I was talking to, to someone about a, about a friend and they had taken this, this uh, master plan course. And I was excited. I said, hey, is he applying it? And they said, no. And that, and that really hurt. That really, that really bothered me. I said, we can't afford that. Yes, God, God equips us. And he empowers us, but we must do our homework. We must be faithful. And I can remember in the Jasmine song, we had a phrase, no excuse produce. It didn't matter how hard that line was, if it was your responsibility to, to play that line, and you you got 24 hours in a day, you learn the line so you can get it done. But I think sometimes we as leaders need to encourage ourselves and be encouraged and continue to be motivated. I've been challenged by that this, this weekend. The other thing I've been challenged by is, uh, is this matter of, of dreaming. To dream great things for God. To actually look and say, God, you can make a difference in, in my community. Um, about three years ago, in the transition that we've been going through in the ministry, about three years ago, I looked at Neighborhood Ministries and I said, somehow, we, it needs some administrative help. I mean, I didn't know much about administration. I didn't know how to define it, but I knew it would have hurt on you if you didn't have it. Um, and I felt somehow this has got to be dealt with. So I, I took on that role. I started to, 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 to dive within the ministry and think, hey, we've got to get things organized. We've got to set ourselves up for growth. Well, now, three years later, we have an administrator. And I have a number of people on staff who are kicking me out of administration to say, we, can, we need you to dream again. We need you to do the things that uh, you did that you did before. And uh, and that's been a real challenge. It's been hard. It's, it's been hard. Um, when I came here, I, I, I wasn't dreaming a whole lot. I, I kind of forgotten how to do that. I was so busy trying to get the details done. But uh, you all have helped. You all have helped. I want to thank you for, 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 for this time. You know, I want to, I want to leave you with this. There are many that are in this room that have been at this a long time. And you are looked upon as, as leaders and as mentors. I want you to know, first of all, I want to thank you for being who you are, for being what God has called you to be. I want you to know that, that, that those of us that are, are still in the apprentice stage, uh, we really need you. We need your leadership. We need your voice. It's exciting to be a part of this growing network. And if there's any way that we can continue to communicate and to, and to share ideas, we need, we need to find more creative ways to do that because we really need you. But then there are others of us that are here that uh, we feel like we're still struggling. We're, we're, still, we're, we're still struggling. There are areas, there may be some basic things that we're struggling with. And we need to be about learning those things and applying those things that we're learning here. We need to take a no excuse produce um, attitude. I mean, there are things that we're called to do that they're not necessarily easy. But if God has put us in the position of leadership, then we must lead. And if there is no one else there next to us to, to model it, then we must go back to the Word of God and get back on our knees and continue to pray, continue to trust God to do a mighty work in us and through us for His namesake and to His glory. That is our role. And if we feel like we, we need more help, let's go, get, let's go get that help. But we still have that responsibility. We are responsible to, to be uh, God's people in society. That's what we're called to do. And so I want to challenge those of you who are here that are just kind of soaking it up and kind of enjoying it. I know what that's like, because I've been doing that. That's been a lot of fun. Uh, but you need to know that when we leave here, we must be about applying what we learn. Thanks.